Every day, your privacy is being invaded from websites you visit, tech companies, people around you, governments, and the list can go on forever. It may feel impossible to regain your privacy and security on the internet, but that's ridiculous. It is possible. Today, I'm going to show you how to regain your privacy on the internet, what becoming anonymous really means, boost your security, and most importantly, be able to spread what you do to other people you know to make a much bigger impact. I have one disclaimer for you. The more private and secure you want to become, the more inconvenient your life will be. This is just a sad reality. To address this issue, we've split things up into three zones. The first is zone one, which is your starting point and what we recommend everybody implements. Zone two will be a bit more intense and expand on things from section one. Zone three will expand more and introduce some of the more extreme solutions for those of you looking to truly disappear as much as you can. These zones are inspired from a traditional threat model and we recommend everybody listening develops their own threat model if they don't want to use our zone system. Again, your privacy matters. Likely by the end of this video, you'll be spammed with great information. So feel free to use our checklist and scoring PDF in the description to help yourself keep up. At the end of the video, I will also have a fun test you can do to evaluate how private and secure you are, which will reference that PDF. Without further ado, let's begin with Zone 1. You should be avoiding your browser or operating system's password manager, bad passwords, or even worse, reusing the same password on several sites, as one breach can lead to any account with the same credentials being breached as well. The best thing to do is use a password manager that is all protected with a strong master password. The simplest recommendation is Bitwarden, a cloud-based manager, and there's also KeePass, which is more designed for local password storage. Aside from passwords, do not answer security questions truthfully, as these are painfully easy easy to guess, even for a stranger. We recommend generating random answers inside of your password manager. The passwords on your device are important as well. Make sure these are long, complex passwords that you're able to memorize. There are easy ways to do this, as demonstrated very well by Mr. Edward Snowden. Margaret Thatcher is 110% sexy. Wow. Additionally, your router is what all of your devices connect to, and that needs a strong password as well. Generate your router password in your password manager to ensure it is very secure. Also, set an admin password to access your web portal and ensure you're at least using WPA2 for the utmost security. And finally, biometrics. These are almost universally less secure than a good password. You also carry the risk of being forced to unlock your phone with biometrics, which can't as easily happen with a password in certain countries like the US. Ensure at the very least that you're disabling biometrics when entering high-risk areas like airports, protests, and other places with heavy law enforcement. 2FA is that text message you receive when logging into a service to add additional protection to your account. 2FA through text messages is better than nothing, but we recommend using a local authenticator app. For iOS, there's Tofu and Authenticator, and Android has and OTP and Aegis. Authy is a more convenient cloud-based solution, but it is closed source. There are also hardware-based keys you can utilize. Don't forget to back these up no matter what you choose, somewhere separate from an account that requires 2FA, so you, you don't get locked out from your 2FA because you don't have the 2FA to unlock the 2FA vault. All of us have a digital footprint, which is any piece of data on the internet tied back to you as an individual. Between all of the data about you, there's likely enough information to understand you better than you understand yourself, and this is all unregulated. To minimize this issue, we need to make our footprints as small as we possibly can. For part one, we immediately recommend starting with Google. Go ahead and disable everything in the Google My Activity page and ensure you're using the least amount of personal information necessary. For other services, if even one of the dozens or hundreds of accounts you own experiences a breach, your information is now publicly online. You should dive into every service you've ever signed up for, and for the ones you no longer need, fake personal information, including the email to something like Gorilla Mail, and delete it. A good place to find services you've signed up for is digging through those old verification emails as well as sites like justdeleteme.xyz. Here are some social media rules for part one. First, make sure to utilize the basic privacy settings given to you within your accounts. Second, don't talk, friend, or follow strangers. Use it strictly for people you know. Third, avoid commenting or responding to public posts that are outside of your group. Fourth, do not hand over any personal information or permissions that websites or apps do not need. 
Facebook doesn't need your home address, and Snapchat doesn't need to track your location all day. A VPN will encrypt your traffic inside a tunnel to prevent all people between you and your VPN from snooping on your traffic. Additionally, a VPN will mask your IP address, which sites use to track and invade you, and even sometimes serve you different prices when shopping based on your location. The main drawback to VPNs is you're transferring trust to a central entity to handle your web traffic. Luckily, picking something trusted doesn't need to be too much of a guessing game. We do VPN reviews on our channel using a systematic community-driven process to keep things as transparent as possible. Our Current top recommendations are Proton VPN, Molvad, iVPN, Winscribe, and Surfshark. I'll leave all of those in the description as well as their reviews so you can compare what works best for you. The internet exists, I mean, more or less so you can communicate, right? And you can do everything in this video and still be communicating insecurely. The first and most important thing is to ensure you're using encryption. This means avoid SMS, AKA the green bubbles, and move to things like iMessage or preferably Signal, which is an easy cross-platform messenger that includes encrypted phone and video calls all with minimal tracking. There are other messengers as well to try out listed on Privacy Tools IO. Outside messages, email is a privacy and security nightmare. The easiest thing to do is to move over to services like ProtonMail and Tutanota. These don't require any personal information and will fully encrypt your emails even when being sent to people using other email providers. You do have to select that specifically when sending the messages. We also covered other options in our recent top five email providers video, so check that out. 33Mail, Gorilla Mail, and Tentmail are all great services to utilize for disposable emails. Browsers are what connect you to the internet, giving them a huge level of control over your privacy and security. For zone one, ensure you're only using trusted extensions from original sources. Next, change your search engine to something privacy respecting. DuckDuckGo is a default option in most browsers. If you're a fan of Google results, then StartPage will give you Google results privately. And if you want the most open and transparent search engine, check out search.me. Lastly, cookies and other data stored by your browser are instrumental tools used to track you. Ensure you're clearing them frequently, using incognito mode when necessary, as well as enabling some of the basic security and privacy precautions your browser may offer. Nowadays, all of us have a tracking device on us 24-7, aka our smartphones. These devices have powerful sensors and technology that are constantly active and collecting data shared with companies, individuals, and governments alike. For Zone 1, opt out of the options you're given. In your settings, disable analytics, telemetry data collection, usage data, go through each app and ensure apps only have permissions for things they need to function. Also disable radios like Wi-Fi, cellular data, NFC, Apple Pay, and especially Bluetooth and GPS when not in use. On a similar note, disable as many features and settings as possible, especially within your applications, and ensure you're removing things you don't need. Less is more, as each app and feature is an additional threat. Make sure you're using a VPN. We already covered that. Your MAC address is a unique identifier that helps identify your device on a wireless network. Lucky for us, iOS 14 and Android 10 now include MAC address randomization, so make sure that's enabled. Lastly, make sure you're using automatic software updates for both the operating system and applications so you're receiving the latest patches and security improvements for your device. Disable the options you're given like analytics, usage data, app settings and permissions, and disable your radios when not in use. Features as well should be disabled if you don't use them, and you should uninstall all apps and programs you don't use, especially the bloatware that comes pre-installed on Windows. A VPN on your computer is also important, along with automatic software updates for your programs and operating system. Your files are at the root of what you want to protect, both sensitive files like your documents, photos, and memories, but also the temporary files like cookies that can all paint a pretty clear picture of who you are. In zone one, remove and clear temporary data as frequently as you can, like logs in your system, temporary data from your web browser, and really anything else that is just passively collected from your usage. You can do this with a tool like Bleachbit and built-in tools within your browser and operating system. As for deleting your sensitive files, just recycling your trash bin doesn't actually delete your files for good. This is a giant misconception. You have to shred your files. Bleachbit is a simple way to do this. Last, and this is just for anything related to storage, make backups. We'll talk about private and secure solutions in zone two and three, but for now, it can be a hard drive you keep at home, in the cloud, anything, I don't really care, just back up your stuff, it's really important. The bare minimum is to have an on-site backup and an off-site backup. 
Something we often forget when talking about digital privacy and security is the real world, which can directly feed the digital world as the relationship between them becomes closer every day. For zone one, never input personal information on a public computer. For personal devices, we recommend being wary with things like smartwatches and fitness trackers that collect data about you and can be disastrous for privacy. We have talked about the options available to you more thoroughly in our privacy health tracking video. On a similar note, the less IoT or Internet of Things devices you have, the better. Alexa does not need to be in every room of the house. These devices are grossly insecure and are only built to track you. Within your home, we do recommend safes and shredders, two things every person should own. We'll leave some options in the description for you to look at for both of those. And that was the end of zone one. If you completed everything here, you're already much better off than most people, and it ideally shouldn't have been terribly difficult to implement. Zone one covered the main things you should know about passwords. Zone two is just a bit higher up in that we'd say to disable biometrics at all times. We talked about the legal differences as well as how it's less secure. So maintain that higher degree of security all day is where we're going to stand in zone two. Going back to your footprint, we're going to minimize this even more. We're gonna make you so small. Uh, step one, and this is a big step, but we'd recommend deleting Google together. Getting away from a privacy intruding, data hungry company by full out deleting your account is something that will do you wonders. I laid out my whole journey and the steps you can take to delete your Google account in its own video. It's not easy, I'm warning you, so just be aware it can be challenging and no one expects this to happen overnight. The second step is to create accounts separate from your main identity, or pseudonyms. You can set these up for specific tasks like shopping, social media, dating, or more, and you can get started with just an email and other pseudonym-specific information. We will cover other software and tools you can use to take your pseudonyms to the next level throughout the rest of this guide. VOIP is the simplest option. Think of it as just a phone number you own digitally. Google Voice, Burner, Hushed, MySudo are some options with a fee. Only problem is some sites will flag these virtual numbers. Prepaid phone sims can be obtained from your store or ordered online with something like mint.com. You'll own a physical number that shouldn't give you any issues for a relatively cheap cost. No matter what you pick, the most important thing is figuring out what each number is tied to. Try to have a method, be it identities or use case. At this point, you should not have any of your real personal information accessible on social media. You're using the service more or less as just a non-personal account that your friends and family know is you, or this may not even be for your friends and family and it's just a casual account for yourself. To go along with this, you shouldn't be posting images of yourself. Clearview AI is a perfect demonstration of how an anonymous account can seriously just go to waste if you just upload your face. So either obfuscate your face or don't post any personal photos. Lastly, social media apps tend to be extremely intrusive. We recommend keeping as much social media as you can within progressive web apps. There are other apps on Android that do this or just use the add to home screen option within your web browser on both Android and iOS. In zone two, your browser is going to be something we can play a lot more with. First, avoid just using one browser as most likely there are reasons to use specific browsers for different use cases. For desktop, Tor, Firefox, Brave, and Safari are all browsers we recommend, each with specific use cases. Tor is for anonymity, so not your personal accounts. Firefox is best hardened and is considered a great private browser for personal usage. Brave is out of the box and ready to go with great security and privacy based on Chromium, which may be better compatible with sites than Firefox. Go Incognito has a quadrilogy that covers all of this much more thoroughly that we'd recommend watching. That will also give you a better idea of how to separate browsers properly. For mobile, check out Tor, Firefox Focus, DuckDuckGo, and Bromite for Android as some things you could look at for different use cases. Those Go Incognito lessons would apply to mobile as well. Free and open source software allows everyone to view and contribute and it's what we generally consider the standard for privacy and security. Try to move as much as you can over to FOSS. To start, look at what you use day to day. Then use alternative2.net and sort by open source to find recommended alternatives. If you're on an Android device, Fdroid is a simple way to immerse yourself with the FOSS community. For iOS, there's Alt Store, but this is nowhere near as developed as Fdroid or as officially supported. Apple uh, doesn't really like that kind of stuff. Lastly, Linux is your main go-to FOSS option for a desktop OS. We'll talk more about Linux in zone three, but for some of you open to it in zone two, 
give it a shot. So there's iOS, Android, and Linux. Which is best for your security and privacy? To start, we classify Android into three types. Type one is what you likely think of a standard Android device from Samsung, HTC, LG, and other manufacturers. These are locked down, Google, the phone manufacturer, and likely your carrier all track you, and these devices tend to have really poor security update support. Type two is stock or close to stock Android. Google is the only sole predominant company tracking you and has much better security update support, already offering us a huge improvement over type one Android. On almost all fronts, iOS crushes type one Android devices. If we compare something like a Pixel to an iOS device, it's really kind of a toss up on all fronts trading blows. In general though, we'd still likely recommend iOS over type two Android as Apple is more privacy friendly than Google. Type three Android is custom ROMs. Lineage OS is an option, but will lower your security of your device. We recommend Graphene OS and Calyx OS as it'll be the most private device you get beating iOS while competing with iOS in the security front as well. These are currently your best bet. As for Linux phones, we don't feel comfortable recommending Linux phones as they're not really ready for mainstream use and Calyx or Graphene we consider stronger in both security and privacy with better software compatibility. So to put it simply, Ditch your Samsung phone, please, or whatever else you bought from your carrier that's locked down into its own ecosystem. If you want something out of the box, decide if you'd like iOS or Android, then get an iPhone or a Type 2 Android device. If you want to explore better options, get a Pixel and flash something like Graphene or Calyx. Over to Computers Part 2. First, we recommend password protecting your BIOS and encrypting your drives with full disk encryption. Encrypting your drives prevents someone from powering on your device and accessing files, or pulling the hard drive out and accessing them without needing a user password. macOS and Linux have great built-in tools. Windows doesn't, though, unless you pay for Windows Pro, because apparently basic security is paywalled. But Veracrypt works on Windows, and we do have a guide covering how to set that up. You can also implement file level encryption for your individual files and folders that need protection. Veracrypt works well for this on any platform as well. You can spoof your MAC address at this point, and there are several tools and methods on different operating systems we recommend checking out. Windows does a lot of tracking on its users, even with everything disabled in the settings. It's kind of terrible. Tools like W10 Privacy aim to dig deeper into the OS and disable things you couldn't normally disable. Warning, this may break some stuff, so be cautious as it's not guaranteed to stop everything. Zone 3 will cover what operating system to choose, but for now, Mac OS will beat Windows on almost all fronts. So if you're making that decision between the two big competitors, Mac OS will win, uh, at least for the price and security world. At this point, we recommend enabling full disk encryption on your drives, like we just talked about. Metadata is another problem. Every file contains something called metadata, which offers you information about the file. This can be incredibly sensitive, as images, for example, can include the location of where the photo is taken. Metadata nowadays can not just expose you to others on the internet, but even services that strip the metadata before publishing your content can abuse it, as Imgur recently proved. There are several EXIF, the metadata in photos, removers. As for other files, the best method is using a tool like Mat2, which strips this data. And finally, disconnect from your screen a bit. Let's go into real world part two. You should have some kind of home security solution, whatever that means to you. At the very least, have security cameras, ideally not fed through some company managing the footage. There are some DIY methods you can look into. You should have alarms in place on windows and doors and especially have plans on what to do during break-ins and other um, intense situations. For tech within your home, there are cable locks you can buy for your laptops. There are also intrusion kits for certain desktops. We'll leave links below for these locks and intrusion kits. By now, you shouldn't have any IoT or smart devices. Seriously. Lastly, for your mobile devices especially, look into getting privacy screen protectors to hide your screen from side angles, as well as covering the cameras on your webcams and computers. There are sliding camera covers to still keep functionality while blocking them when not in use. We'll leave links to this in the description. You are such a stud muffin if you got this far, but zone three is for the legendary folk. So let's go into zone three. You don't need to delete everything, but you should have as clean of a slate as possible, which is possible to do, and we've thoroughly laid out how in Go Incognito 2.4. This is extremely difficult, and it will take time, but be assured it is possible, and we believe in you. I hate to be the bearer of bad news.
but you need to stop your internet addiction. You need to stop looking at it. Social media. Better yet, delete it altogether. That lesson of going cognito covers this more thoroughly, but exporting your data, deleting your data, falsifying your information, and then deleting your accounts is the way to go. We get it, it's hard, but it really is necessary if you're in zone three and your utmost goal is privacy. Back to your browser. At this point, we're going to cover the more advanced techniques to take your browsing to the next level. For your personal accounts, your best bet is to use hardened Firefox, meaning you're configuring the browser for the utmost privacy and security. There are stock settings, scripts, extensions, and more tweaks to make that is all laid out on the Privacy Tools IO website, as well as by us in Go Incognito 3.7 to 3.10. Ironically, if you hardened your browser, your web fingerprint is now unique, which in itself can be used to track you and decrease your privacy. However, this isn't fully a con, but more importantly, it's something you need to remember when deciding what the browser is used for. For a hardened Firefox, which would be extremely unique, this is for personal accounts and things that are directly tied to you, making the fingerprinting really not much of a concern. Push the casual stuff though through something like Tor, which will have a very common fingerprint and that will not be tied to you through these techniques. Behavioral analysis is another tracking technique, abusing things like the way you type, what you type, and how you move your mouse as just a few examples. No matter what browser you're using, this is hard to guard against. And lastly, social engineering is becoming more prominent. In a nutshell, this relies on abusing the natural trust humans have for each other. Phishing emails that disguise themselves as real emails are a form of social engineering, but this can get a lot more complex as someone could call your number requesting information that may seem harmless, but it's actually something important. This is actually a technique used by the magicians in Now You See Me to get the answers to security questions of a bank account. There's no simple way to stop this. Um, if there was, a lot of problems would be solved in our world, but being aware of it is vital, as well as keeping up with the newest attacks and trends. For an easy recommendation, Tor again for anonymity, pseudonyms, and casual non-personal usage, hardened Firefox for your personal accounts, then maybe something like Brave as a Chromium-based backup with decent privacy and security for things reliant on Chromium. For smartphones part three, the first thing is to ditch smart. Dumb phones are great because they don't track you, but they're so dumb you won't be able to do basic things like encrypt your messages. They're also not immune to location tracking through cell tower triangulation. Aside from dumb phones, at this point we'd recommend Graphene OS or Calyx OS. We've reviewed Graphene on our channel and we'll be reviewing Calyx soon, subscribe to catch that. The last option is to not have a phone at all. There are people who rely on a VOIP through their computer alone, which is an option. Lastly, there doesn't need to be a single choice. You can have a custom ROM, an iPhone, and a flip phone, you rich person, all with different use cases designed around your threat model. The possibilities are endless and fully aimed at what you're trying to accomplish, so make the best out of what you have. Let's talk about your computer's operating system. We already talked about Mac OS beating out Windows in almost every regard. Linux, though, has the ability to make things a step further. The ability. Many security researchers actually criticize Linux for not implementing quite as strong security as something like Mac OS, but this is very nitty gritty and the debate is ongoing. Where Linux wins hands down is offering a universally more private option as it's open source and the community can view everything happening within the OS. Here is the hierarchy of what OS to choose based on privacy security. Oversimplified. Windows is on the bottom as the most privacy invading, followed by Mac OS. Generic Linux distros like Linux Mint, Fedora, Debian, etc. Then come the more specific operating systems like Tails OS, Hunix, and Cubes. Tails OS and Hunix are built mostly for anonymity by utilizing Tor, whereas Cubes is built for security and delegates anonymity to the Hunix virtual machine. There is no right answer on what OS to pick. Each has pros and cons, including Windows, so it really comes down to you understanding why you're on an operating system and being aware of its limitations. You may be asking yourself, how do you buy things both online and in real life anonymously? In person, the easy and obvious answer is cash. The internet though <laughs> will complicate things. The first option on the internet is mail in cash, which is rare, but I have seen it. The second option is using gift cards you got in person with cash, like maybe Amazon, Spotify, and other retailers. The third option is getting a non-relatable Visa gift card in person with cash that should work with most sites. The fourth option is cryptocurrencies. You have a few options within this. First, you can use non-private cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin obtained privately through either mining or locally with something like local Bitcoin. 
Second is using a mixer, but these aren't very proven and can be sketchy, so be wary. And third, the recommended crypto option is using a currency built for privacy like Monero. Fifth, there are sites like privacy.com that proxy your card information from sites and your purchase information from your bank, which is pretty neat. To recap, you do have options to buy things anonymously, both in person and online. It just takes some extra effort, but you can do it. We believe in you. It always ties back to the real world. First, at this point, you should physically remove cameras and microphones from being accessible. Utilize external cameras like a plug-in webcam or external mics like the one on your earbuds. Second, while this is not realistic for most people and their threat models, avoid things like facial recognition, AI, and other public surveillance. Wearing sunglasses, a face mask, a hat are all things that help, and there are some products online that aim to help thwart these technologies. That is the end of zone three. But there is actually one last point I wanna make. Advocacy is just so important as just you implementing stuff in this guide won't make as much of a difference as getting all of your friends and family to simply change their search engine to something private or get them to be aware of what privacy even is and why it matters. Your job as a privacy advocate is to not just look after yourself, but everybody else. Think about the other 99% who don't care and how we can help educate and advocate to them. Normalize privacy, add Tor to your desktop, get EFF and other privacy stickers, clothing and merchandise, do school projects on it, ask your boss about it, just talk about it, learn why it's important, have arguments ready for when your friends say they have nothing to hide. There's no right way to solve the issues of privacy or else, well, we wouldn't have such a big privacy concern. So get out there, make a difference, and seriously, just come on, advocate, let's do this. Before wrapping up the video, let's not forget about testing where you are on the spectrum of privacy and security. First, do a quick search with your name, phone number, address, and any other personal information within search engines and see if anything comes up. Second, go to some people searching websites like My Life and the countless others and see if anything comes up. Third, have you implemented everything or close to everything in Zone 1? We have a much more thorough scoring system in our PDF in the description that we encourage you utilize to help yourself get started on your privacy journey. Everyone has different threat models and you should pick which one you wanna be in beforehand, but the goal is for everybody to be at least tech lore approved. And then obviously you can go above and beyond, but let's everyone get to tech lore approved and you will be solid. And that was the end of this video. I want to thank you for watching and especially everybody who made this video happen, including our editor, those who helped proofread the script, everyone who gave feedback on our old video from our Telegram community, those who voted for the best title and thumbnail, and especially our patrons who fund our work. You can join that community as well if you wanna support what we do for some extra perks on your end. We really appreciate all the help and we're trying to hit that $500 a month goal. Seriously, any dollar you have brings us closer to that goal. So support what we do. We also ask you to like this video, subscribe for our future content, like our weekly privacy and security news, Check out Go Incognito, like the shirt says, our full free in-depth course taking you from start to finish. We have device specific versions of this guide for a more thorough look at each device, currently iOS and Android with more like Windows, macOS, and Linux coming soon. And do not forget to share this video. That is something huge that really helps us, but especially the privacy community, as the more people who watch this kind of content, the more we can spread our message. Thanks for watching, and if there's two words that you should remember leaving here today, just two, normalize privacy. See you all next time. Hey everybody, again, this video is probably not just one of the most fun ones to make, but it's also very time consuming, so we really do appreciate any support you give us. Peace out, and I hope you enjoyed this guide.